We're continuing on with our series, Endure, and we're taking a look at 1 Corinthians today, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And we're looking at this whole idea of running to win, running to win the prize. Now, run to win, no Olympic sprinter probably in history has personified what it means to run to win more than that guy up on the screen. I'm not going to lie, I didn't watch the Olympics really much at all. I saw more of the highlights after the fact. But even if I hadn't watched the Olympics, I knew who that guy was. That guy up on the screen was a guy named Usain Bolt from Jamaica. And that guy is fast. Really, really fast. He, he brings new meaning to the word <laughs> sprinter. And it was interesting to watch the video. When I saw this the first time, I was fascinated by it. What took me back is, as he talked about all of this, he said, I wanted to run faster. I wanted to run faster. He was disappointed with his time. If you watch the Olympics and you watched him run, he whipped everybody. You'd see him take off and they'd have the lines and you'd watch the guys run and all of a sudden you'd just see this guy. And everybody else was back here like they were bolted to the pavement and he was gone. But he said, I, I wanted to run faster. He wanted to do better. Now this is coming from a guy that won three 200 meter, meter titles in a row, back to back to back. People haven't done that. But that wasn't good enough. He wanted to run the win. He was a competitor and he wanted to be faster. And as I thought about this, I thought, you know, this lies in stark contrast to what we do sometimes in our lives. A lot of times the approach that people take is quite different than the Usain Bolt approach to life. And we say, you know what? I want life just to be kind of normal. I want life to be kind of average. And there is nothing wrong with the average life. We say, you know what? If I just had like a basic car, a house to live in, and a decent job, I'm good with that. That's perfect. For me, that's good enough. Those guys like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, those guys like Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps, that's great for them. But for me, I'm just happy living where I live, doing what I do every day. I'm happy with my family. I'm happy with my situation. I'm content. I'm okay with that. We're okay with all of these things. But the question today, though, isn't about those things in life because that's fine. Matter of fact, when we begin to pursue those things in life, cars and homes and retirements and things of that nature, our priorities begin to get way out of whack and way out of order. But there's one thing, though, one thing we have to ask ourselves is how do we pursue our relationship with Jesus? How do we look at that relationship? What's our goal for this relationship? Do we approach it with the attitude, kind of the cursory attitude of, ah, it's fine. It's all fine. Me and God, we're fine. I show up on Sunday. I go home on Sunday afternoon. Maybe I'll go to a Bible study. We're okay. It's average. Paul is writing here to the Corinthians, and he was encouraging them to give more than just average attention to this relationship with Jesus. And he wrote this passage that we're studying today in 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27. He reminds the church in Corinth that when it comes to our faith, our pursuit of Jesus needs to be more than average. More than just something that we do on a list of things we do each week. A lot of us have, right? We have a list of things we have to do each week, a lot of things we have to accomplish, and we put our relationship with God, we slot him in somewhere. And Paul's saying, no, this can't work this way. He's saying, all that other stuff, that's fine. But this one thing, you've got to run to win. You've got to do your best at following Jesus. You've got to give it your all. And he's reminding the church of that. As followers of Jesus, we have to make our relationship with him our top priority. Have we made a relationship with Jesus our top priority, our priority? primary pursuit, the thing that's most important, the thing that draws us out of bed each day, is that the thing? Is that the thing that we are pursuing wholeheartedly in everything that we do? And we're going to learn a few lessons. We're going to learn a few things from this passage that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And he had went through and talked about this and what it meant to run to win. And the first thing, the first lesson that we learn from this passage is that we must pursue Jesus wholeheartedly. 
We have to pursue Jesus wholeheartedly. Our relationship with him, we have to give it our very best. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. We're going to stop and read the whole thing. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but they do it, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We're going to go back to the first verse, verse 24. We have to pursue Jesus wholeheartedly. Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Paul in this passage is drawing a comparison between the Corinthians' own Asmenian games, as they called them, which were hosted every other year, as opposed to our Olympics that were hosted every four years. These were an every other year event in Corinth, and how we should follow Jesus. He was drawing some parallels there. It was something when he was talking to them, they knew what he was talking about. It made sense to them. Okay, this is how we should have our relationship with Jesus. This has to be a top priority. The pursuit of winning those games required that to be a primary focus in the people's lives. It was something that they invested in. It was something that they had to do and something that they had to give their very best of themselves to compete. The people that were in those games, they just didn't go to show up. They didn't want to be an also-ran. They didn't want to be the guy in the Usain Bolt videos that were dragging back behind when everybody else was finished and they were coming across the line. They wanted to win. They entered the games because they wanted to do their best. They wanted to compete. And Paul is sending a message to the church in Corinth that following Jesus wholeheartedly, we're going to have to give our all. And it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us something when we follow Jesus, when we make this a primary pursuit. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. said, so Then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're not really good sometimes at denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following. We're pretty good at hanging around the periphery, and we do pretty good with that. But the actual idea of changing what we do, changing our primary motivation each and every day, that's a lot harder, and that's a lot harder thing to do. And it's something that requires a lot of effort. But Paul's saying this is something we have to do. We have to pursue Jesus and make him the top priority in our life. Following Christ isn't a casual pursuit. All of us have hobbies. Do you all have hobbies, something that you like to do? So for some people, they like to work with wood. For some people, they like to sing. For some people, they like to play an instrument. For some people, they like to hunt or fish or quilt or sew. There's a whole bunch of different hobbies and different things we do. And we would say, most, for the most part, we casually pursue them. We do those things. They don't consume our whole life. It's just something that we do. And Paul's saying here that following Jesus isn't one of those things. It isn't one of the something that we do things. It is what our life is all about, pursuing him and following him and making him our primary goal in our life and the reason that we get up in the morning and what motivates us. Being a follower of Jesus is more than just going to church or Bible study. It's a 180-degree realignment of our desires and our priorities to place Jesus first above everything else. We have to look at all the areas of our life, all the things that we do as an employee, as a parent, as a husband or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a, or a son or a daughter. And we have to look at that and say, okay, where does Jesus fall in this? Hopefully he's at the top. Because that changes everything when we put him there. The older you get in life, you begin to pick up many different titles. The older I've gotten, I've gotten more titles. And if you're a kid, the older you get, the more titles you're going to have. By the time uh, you go to be with the Lord, there are going to be a lot of things. Depending on who you are and who's referring to you, you have titles such as these. Mom, dad, husband, wife, grandma, grandpa. 
employee, teacher, coach. We pick up a lot of titles along the way. The list goes on and on. And some of these titles, it gets interesting with some of the titles sometimes. I know some of the moms especially. That's one of the titles that all the moms love to be mom, right? But sometimes they wish they could change their name just for a minute. Because after 8,000 times in five minutes, mom, 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 they've had a little bit too much mom, okay? A little bit too much of that name, of that title being used over and over again. And sometimes, sometimes they need a break. If you're a teacher, same thing. Like Beth, Miss Henry, Miss Henry, I'm sure you hear that a thousand times a day. Yep. We hear, you hear those things. It's one of those things. But our, that is not our identity. That is not our primary identity. Our primary identity is being a follower of Jesus. And that has to define everything and shape everything that we do. You see, we're never going to be the best mom, the best husband, wife, father that we're supposed to be if we get these things in the wrong order. We need Jesus being our primary focus in order to make these other areas of our life all that they should be. If we're going to be a great dad or a great husband, we need to be a great follower of Jesus. If we're going to be a great mom or a great grandma, We need to be first a great follower of Jesus. If we put that piece first, all these other things will fall in behind. And we're going to be great at those things too. Because we put Jesus first and seek to model how he lives and seek to model what he desires for our life. But when we get him in the wrong order, we never really reach the potential that God has called us to, God has created us for. There's a second lesson that we learn from this passage in 1 Corinthians 9. Let's so turn with me to verse 25. Paul writes this, he says, Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Paul once again highlights this idea that if we're going to win the prize, as he calls it, we're going to have to train. We're going to have to put forth some effort. We're going to have to put forth our best. The athletes who would have been known to the people of Corinth, they practiced this idea of self-denial. They said, you know what? What I eat, what I drink, how I train, that is going to equip me and prepare me to compete in the games and to be successful. The interesting thing, though, is Paul said, you know what? They're going to compete in those things, and that crown isn't going to last. If you went back and thought back four years ago, Outside of a couple of names, you're not going to remember who won the Olympics four years ago. You're not going to remember who won all the events four years ago because it doesn't really last. But the crown that Paul is talking about is the one that lasts forever. Our home, our future in eternity that we get to spend with God in heaven. And that is something that's worth pursuing. Pursuing this requires each of us to spend time in God's word. We need to spend time knowing what it means to be a Christ follower. This Bible was more than just ornamental. It's something that we have to read, and it's something that we have to hide in our heart. It's something that we have to meditate on and pray about. It's something we have to continue to learn and study and ask questions about. We need to continue to put forth effort in that. We need to continue to put forth effort in praying and talking to God. We need to put forth time to talk to God and allow his spirit to guide us, shape us, and move us to being more like he wants us to be. And finally, we've got to put into practice all the things that we're learning. We learn all these things, and that was kind of the issue with some of the Pharisees. They learned a lot of different things, but they didn't put it into practice all that well. They had a lot of head knowledge, but not a lot of heart knowledge, and putting those things to work in their lives. And that's what we're called to do. We need to continue to do what God has called us to do and to make a difference in our world. You see, there's never a point in our relationship with Jesus where we've arrived. We never have got it all figured out. It just doesn't work that way. We continue to grow and to learn and to be refined and to be shaped into what God has called us to be. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 through 14, Paul talks about this. He tells the Philippians, he says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. 
Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul illustrates in his own life that it, he is a work in progress. We're all works in progress. I'm a work in progress. I hope that a year from now, I'm not in the same place I am spiritually with God that I am today. I hope that I've continued to grow and to learn to be more like him and follow his image more closely. It's a continual work in progress as we stretch and we grow and we seek Jesus. We don't ever have it all figured out. We never have all the answers. Until the day we die, it's a continual process of learning and growing. A friend told me a story one time about his son growing up. And his son was protesting the fact that he had to go to school. He was a little kid, and he was protesting that he had to go to school. And he told his dad, let's see, dad, I got this figured out. He said, I can tie my shoes, okay? I know my alphabet, and I can count to 10. Got it. I have learned everything that I need to learn. It's done, okay? It's over. But there's a lot that this little kid needed to go to first grade for. There was a lot that he was missing out on. There were a lot of details that he'd yet to learn, a lot of lessons that he had yet to accomplish. And if he'd have stopped right there, he'd have been limiting himself in a huge way. If he'd have stopped growing at that point, he was going to be limiting all that he could become and limiting his potential. Sometimes we do this with our spiritual walk. We grow, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we say, you know what? That's good enough. I believe in Jesus, and it is. His grace is enough for us. But Paul has called us, the Bible called, tells us we need to continue to grow and learn and be more like Jesus every day. We need to continue to pursue this relationship. We need to continue to learn what it means to be a follower of his word and allow it to mold us and allow it to shape our lives. We need to continue to work towards this thing. There's a third lesson that we learn from this passage in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, and that is we have to battle against our earthly nature. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Paul writes this. He said, we'll start in verse 26. He says, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. He says, I do not fight like a man beating the air. He said, no, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul makes it clear that following Jesus can be a battle. It's something that we have to work at. It's something we have to work for. He tells us, the church at Corinth, that he beats his body and makes it his slave. And the image that they would have thought about was the image of the ancient boxers of that time. It was a bare knuckle thing where they had leather throngs tied around their hands. And the guys that engaged in that they were beat up, and it was a rough battle for them. They went through a lot, and you would know if somebody was a fighter because they looked rough. They looked beat up. Their bodies were battered. Paul's saying, I'm doing this with my spiritual life. I'm working against all these things that that's, uh, war against my soul. In the ancient times, the Carex was the herald that in the games announced the rules of the contest. And Paul's saying here that he not only proclaims the rules, but he engages himself in the contest. He's not some guy just passing out information. He's saying here, I'm going through the same thing that you are. I relate to what you're doing because it's a battle for me too. It's a battle for me as well. And that's what he's presenting here. He has to, but he plays by the same rules. And he's living out this gospel message himself. We're going to continue to battle sin all our lives. It's a challenge. There are lots of things in our life. And each of us have things that trip us up. I have my things. You have your things. I'm not going to tell you my things. But I have a lot of things. I have things that I have to struggle with and wrestle with. And there are things that each of us has to deal with each day. Pride and greed and lust and anger. There are lots of things that war against our souls, and a lot of things that cause us to, to become defeated at times, to allow us to give in. 
But we need to continue to battle and not to understand that these things that we're going through, what we face, this is a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul writes this. Ephesians 6, verse 12, he said, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. This is our struggle. And we have to understand that. Sometimes we feel really bad. With, Man, I'm a failure. I'm not who God wants me to be yet. And this is one of the lives of Satan. Because we're battling him. These temptations come from him. All these things that we face, they come from him. That's where these temptations come from. We're battling against something that's far bigger than our greed or our desires. We're battling. It's a spiritual battle. And Paul's saying here that we need to be ready, that we need to continue to wage war on those things. And he's saying, you know what? Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Many years ago, I had the chance to go to a skating party. And it was interesting as I watched the kids go round and round the skating rink. And the, the funny part about it was there, these kids for the skating party were like in first or second grade. And the funny part about having a skating party with first and second graders is, spoiler alert, they can't skate. They just can't. It's a wreck, man. You watch them, they put on the skates, and it's just, it's, it's one big crash fest over and over again. And as I was watching the kids at the party, I knew they couldn't skate, and I knew the kid that I brought to the party couldn't skate. So I thought this should be good. So I helped her get her shoes laced up and get stood up on her feet. And I thought, this is going to get ugly really fast, okay? And I'm just hoping there's not too many tears, and I hope I got a couple bucks if I need to buy her a pretzel or something to make her feel better, because this is going to be, this is going to be ugly. So I helped her out to the rink, and I said, I can walk around with you and help you. And the interesting response I got was, no, don't want your help. And I thought, all right, fine. So I went and sat on the side and just watched. And it went something like this. If you watch little kids skate before, it goes like this. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. And then they pull themselves back up. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. All the way around. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. All the way around. And I watched this and I thought, well, when we get back to the end, it's over. So we'll take the skates off and we'll try it again. Or I'll jump out and I'll help. Nope. Still didn't want help. And went around again, shuffle, shuffle, crash, shuffle, shuffle, crash. And I continued to watch this, and I was intrigued. I was fascinated watching this as they went around. When their friends tapped out and said, I've had enough, and went to go play video games and took off their skates, they kept going. I thought, this is interesting. Either they're really stubborn or really foolish. I'm not sure which, but it's, this is interesting to watch. They continued to go, and they continued to go. It was over a solid hour. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. But the interesting thing is I watched them skate, as I watched them go around, the shuffle, shuffle, crash begin to spread out more and more. And by the time they were all done, they could skate. Now, they weren't going to win any titles or win any awards, but they could skate. And the crashes became fewer. And they continued to get their balance and get the feeling of what it meant to have wheels on their feet. And they continued to go because they didn't give up. And they continued to battle. Sometimes our relationship with Jesus looks a lot like this. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. Shuffle, shuffle, crash. We start off and we have the best intentions and we crash. We have to decide, are we going to keep shuffling? Are we going to keep moving forward, pursuing Jesus? Or are we going to give up, take off our skates, and just sit on the sidelines and just say, this is as good as it's going to get? Paul's encouraging us to run to win, to finish the race, to do our best. Are we continuing to battle? Do we go before our Heavenly Father and seek His strength when our strength isn't enough? Do we continue to go before Him and go into his word and find encouragement from us to lift us up in the dark times. Because guess what? The more we pursue Jesus and the more we follow him, we're going to crash sometimes. It's inevitable. 
But those crashes get spaced out a little bit more and a little bit more as we continue to follow him, as we continue to pursue him in our life. The more we become more like Jesus, the more we follow him, we're going to find some of these crashes are less and less violent as we go because God is with us and we're continuing to pursue him and we have the armor to help us through those difficult times. As followers of Jesus, we have to make our relationship with him our top priority. We have to pursue him wholeheartedly and continue to grow in our faith as we battle our earthly nature. Maybe we've yet to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're going to have an opportunity to do that now, an opportunity to accept him as our Lord and to follow him. Maybe we've accepted Christ as our Savior and we're struggling, we're shuffling and crashing, shuffling and crashing. And the crashes are coming with increased frequency and we just need some prayer. We'd love to pray with you today and just encourage you uh, just quietly down front. But wherever you're at, we invite you to continue to pursue Jesus and run the wind because with Jesus, we will endure. We invite you to stand as we sing.